In today's episode of The Insect Hunter, I'm going to be showing you off my insect collection and some of the awesome specimens I've found over the years. Before I get started looking at my insect collection with you guys, I want to give you guys the warning that mine is not the most organized. It's somewhat dirty. It's not perfectly pinned everything. So that's why I've been hesitant to share this video is because I'm trying to teach people how to do it right. But I honestly struggle with pinning insects because it's just so time consuming. If I had my wish, I would just be out collecting insects, catching them and releasing them all the time because that's what I enjoy. But anyways, I'm gonna show you guys some of the different specimens in here. I don't think I'm gonna be able to show all of this to you guys in just one video, so I may release a second or third video showing off some more specimens. But we're gonna jump into here and start looking at the different specimens. If I remember any stories about them, I'll share them with you, and we'll just go ahead and jump in. So we'll go ahead and we'll open up my case. Um, as you can see here, it's got these little elbows, and you just kind of twist those in order to pull this glass off. So I'm gonna go ahead and just pull out this plexiglass and you can't smell it, but it has a very overwhelming smell of just insects in general rotting. It's very delicious. All right, so just pull that out there. You do want to have some sort of protective case on it. This is basically just like a wooden case and it has some holes in it where you can slide that plexiglass into and then that holds them in. And then I just have styrofoam in the bottom. You could get something nicer, put an actual cloth or something so it looks cooler but I just use styrofoam. And like I was saying before, you know, it's kind of dirty. Right here is like a leg. I think it's a leg of this grasshopper or a different grasshopper that's been consumed by a dermestid beetle. So anyways, we'll just start going through the specimens. So here's one dragonfly. And as you can see, dragonflies, from what I've seen, can rotate their heads in weird ways. So it's like rotated its, um, rotated its head like 40 degrees to the right or something, which is messed up. And with dragonflies, the key thing for identifying them is on the wings, which I am not the best at. And as you can see, the dragonflies have kind of lost their color as well. They kind of lose that color over time. And then these wings haven't dried out perfectly flat, so this might have had some chemical get on it. I'm not sure. The other one had perfectly flat wings, but this one, they're kind of bent a little bit. Here's a damselfly. The way you can tell a difference between a damselfly and a dragonfly, for the most part, they have these longer tails, but it has to do with when they land, they will fold their wings. Damselflies will take their wings and fold them up, but dragonflies, they will um, keep their wings out all the time. They don't have the ability to fold them in. Damselflies are typically smaller, but that's not always true. Here's that uh, grasshopper drumstick that's been consumed. Mm, very appetizing. <laughs> so you see, that's what happens is dermestid beetles will get in here and they'll start feeding on the exoskeletons of the different insects you have. And some of these insects in here are from my college class when I went and did my undergrad at BYU-Idaho, so they're quite old. But anyways, we'll just throw that out. That's just garbage. All right, here's some different um, types of grasshoppers. This one here is family Tridactylidae, which, if I recall correctly, are called pygmy mole crickets. It's just a super tiny cricket. You're probably not even gonna be able to see it, but try to get a zoom in on that as best as I can. But they're these tiny little crickets. They're just so small. They're kind of cute. I really like them, actually. And this one's on a point mount, which eventually I'll hopefully do a video teaching how to do point mounts. But they're a challenge and take even more time. So I, again, I don't enjoy it. But anyways, this is the family Tetrigidae. And some people call them ground hoppers or pygmy grasshoppers. They're a really tiny grasshopper. And I believe it's part of their pronotum. But anyways, part of the back of their thorax extends back all the way behind their wings, which is kind of odd, but they're pretty cool looking things. And this guy's got like a Lego grasshopper stuck on the back of his leg. Oh, we're gonna just make this worse. 
there we go. Some leg from some other consumed thing that was stuck on here. Just a normal short horned grasshopper, I think is what they call them, a critidae. They'll spit up stuff out of their mouth. Nothing all that exciting. I don't remember anything about that. This is a, I believe this is a tree cricket. And they look different than other crickets. They're kind of interesting. It might be a bush cricket too, but anyways, there are these crickets that live in trees. They don't really live on the ground. And they're pretty interesting looking guys, a lot longer legs. Almost looks like he's on stilts, those really long legs. Now you can see it's a female. It's got that ovipositor back there, pretty long. A lot of people get scared of the ovipositors on crickets. They think they're stingers. <laughs> Here is a beautifully preserved cricket, perfect. As you can see, the abdomen basically had some major issues. The wings just got eaten by a dermestid beetle, and this one is, see how old this specimen is. It's about um, seven years old, almost seven years, this thing had some major issues. I'm just gonna throw this one out. I mean, there's no point in keeping this at this point. It's lost part of its back. It just, it's an ugly looking specimen. Here we've got a cockroach. This one is an American cockroach. As you can see, like I was saying, I don't always pin them correctly. This one doesn't look like it's totally flat. It's probably leaning this way a little. But anyways, you can see how long that antennae goes. The other one got broken. These antennae are just so sensitive. And if I was a really thorough pin, uh, pinner, I could have gone and taken this and tried to straighten that out, but I mean, it's so much work. And then to have it break on you is just so frustrating. But yeah, this is one of those pests. This was from Texas. And these things, there was like a upper floor in my office at um, one of my jobs at Texas A&M. And on the upper floor, it was like this abandoned attic. And it was just filled with storage. And I'd go up there and I could hear these things crawling around. So I'd just flip on a light and I could find them. So I caught this one and added it to my collection. They're quite tasty too. This one belongs to, this is another cockroach. I think this roach is actually just one from out in the wild. I don't think this one is a significant pest. But it's some sort of wood roach, just kind of feeds on rotting wood and things like that. I don't believe this was a significant pest. Definitely have some broken antennae on this one. Caught on the floor in a building, so it actually could be a pest. Not sure though, I'm not a cockroach expert. Now this praying mantis is not very well pinned in all honesty. I This was one of my first ones I pinned, and you know, this is like eight years ago or seven years ago, I don't know, um, just a long time ago. And I didn't pin it correctly, but it does show some interesting principles and things. So if you look on here, first off on the paper there, you can see there's this dust and powder. Can you see it? That is just basically, I think, waste from the dermestid beetles that have fed on it and that just waste has come off. But you can look and you see that wing, see how the wing has been consumed? So those have been dermestid beetles that have come in and they've eaten part of that wing off. So you should really put mothballs in here like you see right here. I usually would put a mothball there, but I mean, it's just a lot of maintenance, so I haven't done it. Some places will actually like keep them in freezers. Like look at the arm on this. Do you see that arm right there? How that arm was just hollowed out. See right in there, right in there. But anyways, it wasn't the best pinned one. I mean, it kind of works. <laughs> its abdomen's really deflated. I could have gone in and dissected it and uh, put some cotton in there, but I mean, like I've said before, the pinning is not my favorite and it can take a lot of work, but anyways. Oh, look right here. Probably not gonna see that, but there's a thrip. Thrip's in here. Wonder how he got in here. It's like impossible to see. There we have just a average ordinary earwig um, that we commonly find here in Idaho, family Forficulidae. 
And then this type here is the type we'd commonly find in Texas. Anisolabididae. Some of these family names are just crazy. And when I was in school at Texas A&M, I had to memorize all of these and way more. We had to memorize almost 200 family names of insects. So you would get a random specimen, and you have to guess what kind it was. I mean, it was challenging. So I would just sit with like, um, I'd sit with like flashcards like all day. That's all I did is just sat and memorized names. So that was so much fun. This is some sort of bark lice or something. I mean, it's almost impossible to see. You have to have a macro, a macro or microscope to see this thing. It's just so small. I'm not gonna say much else about it. This is from Texas. Somebody traded it for me. It's a good tip for you guys. Trade with other people. Somebody traded me this. It's a striped, st striped stick insect. Pseudophasmatidae. So I guess it's not a true stick insect, but basically they're a lot like a stick insect. But they have stripes, and I also think these ones release a stinky smell that can, um, that can irritate you if you breathe it in or get it on your eyes, etc. It's really lost its color. It had black and white stripes on it is what it looked like. And color, it's just what you have to deal with. You might not have the same color. I haven't had too many insects keep their color perfectly, but it all depends on what kind of an exoskeleton it is. Cause I mean, some of these beetles look exactly like they did when I first got them. All right, so here's a couple different types of assassin bugs. And these ones go out and they hunt other insects and they have a really, they have a long beak, which they'll go and they'll stab that into other insects. And this one, I think, trying to mimic a milkweed bug, which is this one right here. Try to show them for comparison. There we go. I think it's trying to mimic like a milkweed bug or something. I think I found both of these on milkweed. Yeah. Um, to pass an insect to another person, but if you were to pass this to another person, you're supposed to put your pinkies together and then pass it. And that makes it so you're not like moving your hand or like stabbing someone and there's less likely a chance of it getting damaged or hurt. The pinkies kind of help you keep your hands together and coordinated. But anyways, that is the pinky method. It's magical. <laughs> here's another type, here's another assassin bug. I love assassin bugs, they're so cool. I think he's got some lint or something stuck on his head, but anyways. Like the mast hunter bugs in one of my episodes, those are assassin bugs. Pretty awesome. So this is a leaf-footed bug. This is a really big specimen. And they're called a leaf-footed bug because of these spur-like things on the back of their legs. Um, I don't know if they help with camouflage or if they're in any way defensive, but anyways, they have them probably for camouflage, I'd assume. They mostly just feed on plants. They're usually not significantly harmful to humans. Here's a smaller leaf-footed bug. I think this one's one from Idaho. Look at the cool stripes along this area here. The red, yellow, red, yellow. I mean, it's not really yellow, it's just clear. Kind of pretty stripes, almost like a clownfish or something. Pretty cool. Here is a squash bug. And these are, they'll feed on pumpkins, squash, things like that quite commonly. A lot of people get these confused with kissing bugs. Kissing bugs are actually feeding on people or other animals. These are feeding on plants. But they have the same type of mouth part, which is how they would transmit a disease. Pretty cool. All right, let's look at these now. Go to the family Scutellaridae, which is jewel bugs. Some of these can be very shiny, very nice colors. Look pretty cool. These ones aren't all that interesting. The key thing with these guys is they don't have the scutellum, which is like a triangle on their back. 
They look just like stink bugs, but they don't have a scutellum, that triangle, so. This is a tree hopper. And the cool thing about them is that tree hoppers will often have like these little spikes or thorn-like things. So this one you see um, right in here, it's got like these little thorn spikes coming off of it. Some of them can have super interesting, cool detailed spikes or other things coming off of them. I really always have liked tree hoppers. They're pretty cool. So here are a couple aphids. Oh, there's a live fly running around on the thing. <laughs> I think he wants to be part of the collection. Um, sorry, buddy. Maybe not the best idea to be blowing on it. I'm gonna probably blow some pieces off of these guys. <laughs> Anyways, those are just aphids. Nothing that interesting to say about them. Um, Here's a lace wing with those beautiful wings. Always love lace wing wings. That's why they call them lace wings because they're just so lacy, I guess. <laughs> they're just very intricate, delicate, and just interesting. So that's a lace wing. I think this is a green lace wing, although the color is basically lost. Here I've got some ladybugs, family Coccinellidae. Um, technically, I think they're more properly termed lady beetles ladybird beetles, there's a hundred different ways to call it. But anyways, nothing too crazy about them. I mean, you can find them just about everywhere, but they do really lose that color. I mean, they've turned into this dark brown orange color where they were much more red or bright orange before, um, before they were preserved. Next here we have some weevils, nice and small guys. Nothing too crazy to say about them. Weevils just have really long snouts. That's kind of how you differentiate them from other beetles for the most part and the way their antennae look and some other factors, but that's a good general rule. This one here is a Staphylinid beetle or Rove beetle. And uh, yeah, they're just tiny little beetles. They almost look like earwigs. Next we have some of my favorite insects. I love beetles, especially scarab beetles and these jewel beetles that I have here. Um, I'll show you these ones first. First off, this one is not on the right type of pin. That pin is not the right kind. And it might be eroding away. It's not like stainless steel. But look at this beetle. Um, I'll try and show you these angles and I'll show you the front. Look at the shiny colors on this beetle. I just love these beetles. They're so pretty. Um, the emerald ash borers in this group, which is a really bad pest, but you can't help but admire how pretty those colors are. Just a really pretty colored beetle. This was a small one. I think this one, once you start telling people you work with insects, people just start looking for you. But this one, I think my sister was cleaning her house or something and just found it like in a closet. So kind of interesting, but I just love that shiny color. And then it's hard to see, but let me see if I can get it. Yeah, if you look underneath it, there's just this shiny metallic color. It's really pretty. And a lot of these, you know, I think are good enough you could make them into jewelry. This guy here is very poorly pinned. Like, look at that. <laughs> He's way up like that, but I still keep this thing just because of how beautiful it is. This thing literally you could make into some jewelry like it's that pretty. It's just a beautiful one. This one, I was working at a campsite teaching youth groups um, for like a church camp thing. And on my tent, this thing was just sitting there. And so I just grabbed it and I was like, wow, this is an amazing, beautiful beetle out in the middle of the woods sitting on my tent. I mean, it's beautiful. You could turn it into an earring. You'd have to have another for the pair, but <laughs> it's just got really pretty colors. Let's see if we can show the bottom there, kind of that side. Kind of see that, just that color. And, you know, it'll shift colors. It'll be red, green, purple. It just changes depending on how the light shines off of it. But really nice colors on it. This one was here in Idaho. Just a overall pretty beetle. Even if it's not pinned properly, I still keep it. I know it looks like crap, but... It's a very beautiful beetle in my opinion, so I gotta keep it. Okay, this is a 
This is a scarab beetle. This one was from out in Texas, I believe. And a lot of these scarab beetles, folks like to refer to them as June beetles. And you know, there's different species of what people like to call June beetles or June bugs. But anyways, this one's quite common. They're common in Indiana as well. They're just a pretty interesting beetle. And then again, these are scarabs, so they're different, but they've got very shiny, very shiny underside and back. Just overall pretty in general. I love scarabs. I just think they're so cool. Yeah, this bark beetle is not supposed to be in the scarab group. It's actually a type of weevil. So I'm going to move him over to the weevil group, but it doesn't look like a normal weevil. It's very different, very distinct. We'll move him over with the weevils. Here's my scarab beetles. I won't really show off many of them much more. I will show off the 10 line June beetle, which are common here in Idaho. A lot of people hate them, but I love them. I think they're really cool and they squeak, which is just fun. And see again, not a straight pin. This was just, <laughs> this was a eight years ago pin of just not doing a good job. And I think what happens is you get hesitant when you're putting it in, you're not confident. You need to just get in there and just stab it in and not be afraid to hold it or like put it in. If I were to do it again today, I could do it very well, but I just, you know, when I was younger, when I wasn't comfortable, as comfortable with insects, it's hard to get straight or be confident and hold that bug really tight because your mind is saying, why are you holding this bug? It's scary. Um, so you have to get used to it. A few different other scarab beetles here. Also have this one that I really like. I mean, it's a bad one. It's a pest. It's a Japanese beetle. But it's hard to not think that they actually look somewhat pretty. You know, it's got the green and it's got that brown on its back. This is a Japanese beetle, a major pest. These guys are bad. And then if you look on like the bottom, it almost has like these striped hairs. But yeah, these guys are a major pest, especially out in Indiana. That's where I got these. We would catch these things by tens of thousands in traps and we just had almost infinite numbers. That's all the insects I'm gonna show you guys in my collection for today. I'll show you some more in the next episode, which will come out next month. If you enjoyed this video, like, let me know in the comments which insects you enjoyed seeing and uh, make sure and subscribe and click the bell so you stayed notified when new episodes come out for the Insect Hunter where big adventures start small.